Welcome to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our focus is the novel coronavirus. I'm Josh Sharfstein, a faculty member at Johns Hopkins and also a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal with this podcast is to bring evidence and experts to help you understand today's news about the novel coronavirus and what it means for tomorrow. If you have questions, you can email them to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, Stephanie Desmond speaks to Andrew Pekosh, a virologist at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and a previous guest on this podcast. This time, they talk about whether people can be reinfected with the novel coronavirus. Let's listen. Today, I'm here with Andy Pekosh, a virologist at Johns Hopkins. We're going to talk about how we figure out how many people have been infected with COVID-19 and what that means going forward. Andy, thank you so much for being with me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. I wanted to talk to you first about these antibody tests that I've been hearing a lot about. First, could you tell me what an antibody test is and what it will tell you? Yeah, so the antibodies are what we make in response to an infection. And right now, um, there's a lot of emphasis on coming up with antibody tests so that we can understand essentially two questions. One is, who's been infected with this virus? Um, there's been a lot of mild disease reported uh, after infection. And so we really feel like we've missed uh, the total number of people that have been infected because there was so much focus on the severe disease. And then the second important question, the harder question, is does my antibody response protect me from reinfection with this virus? So the latter is really important because if you take an antibody test and you find out that I have antibodies, and generally it should mean, hey, I'm immune. But that's not necessarily what it means. Absolutely. With many of the respiratory viruses, if you have a good antibody response in the blood, you can be relatively sure that you're, you're protected, if not for completely, from at least severe disease. But with coronaviruses, um, some of the literature that's out there with some of the ones that cause mild disease, and even with the ones that cause severe disease like MERS and SARS coronavirus, the original one, those antibody responses can sometimes fade pretty quickly. And so um, they're not as long lived as we think they might be. So we don't know where SARS-CoV-2 falls on this spectrum of some coronas induce immune responses that fade quickly, others induce responses that stay longer. And the, unfortunately, the answer to that is gonna come with time. And no one wants to wait six months for the studies to really be done. Everybody wants an answer now because obviously we all wanna get away from as much of this public health intervention as we can. And knowing if you're gonna be reinfected, can't be reinfected is gonna help with those decisions. I'm seeing reports here and there of uh, different antibody tests with different results. Uh, why is it so sort of confusing right now? Are some of the tests not quite up to snuff? Is it just that we don't have a large enough sample size? Yeah, you, you know, there's two things about this. T a test can be a good test or a bad test, but uh, the, the other thing that's important is who's administering the test. Laboratories at public health, state departments of public health, laboratories at hospitals, um, all have groups that do something called validation. So they get a test in and they actually pull samples, they pull positive samples, they pull negative samples, they do hundreds of samples to make sure that the tests are performing consistently and that they get a sense of what the false positive and false negative rates are. Not all laboratories are as rigorous as that. So you have this variable quality of tests and sometimes variable quality of the groups that are implementing the tests that can really uh, skew your numbers and really provide false information. It feels like we're all in a hurry to find the test. And are we sometimes, are we maybe cutting corners a little? Is it, are we approving things that we aren't quite sure work yet? Yeah, you know, I think everybody wants to have tests on the market. You know, the FDA has been a little loose in terms of making of their guidelines for what tests have to be. I think they also realize that they need tests out there, but I think it also contributes to the noise in the system that can be very confusing in terms of when you start seeing some results from these tests. And these tests, I just want to point out, are very different from the ones that tell you if you have COVID or not. 
Absolutely. Most antibodies will only be really detectable five to sometimes 10 days after an infection. And so they're not going to tell you that you're currently infected. They're just going to tell you that at some point in time, you have been exposed to the virus in a way that has caused your body to react to it. And I know that we use the antibody tests, for example. I know I had one when I started to work at Hopkins where they tested my blood and they said, oh, you don't have any um, antibodies for mumps. And so they gave me a booster shot. Absolutely. And, and in, in essence, that's the same thing that we're going to be wanting to do with this kind of information is we want to know the people who have antibody responses. When a vaccine rolls out, we're going to be moving that into the people that don't have antibody responses because that'll be the most important population to, to vaccinate. So a lot is riding on what these antibody responses mean. We just need some time from the research community to really be able to uh, get all the facts and make some conclusions on that. And again, everybody wants an answer right away. So let me uh, shift a little. I want to talk to you about a question I'm hearing a lot, um, and I know you're hearing a lot. It's about whether or not COVID is seasonal, like the flu. Um, you know, is it going to get warm and suddenly cases will go down? Do we have any handle on that? Uh, you know, it's, it's, we have a few things that we can read from. First, you know, I think everybody thinks COVID is a respiratory seasonal virus because it just happened to be emerge in the winter time. We don't know if that was just pure chance or if the conditions in the winter did convey some sort of uh, advantage to the virus for spreading. What we do see though is in the southern, we look at this to the southern hemisphere, which is in the middle of their sort of summer, early fall, and you can see some significant spread of this virus in Australia, in South America, in parts of South Africa. So I think my answer to that question is it's probably not seasonal in the way influenza is. And that's because there are so many people that are susceptible that even if conditions are a little less than optimal for the virus, it can still find people who it can infect. One, two years down the line, this may become a seasonal virus when those other factors are playing a, a bigger role. But for now, with so many people having no immunity to this virus, it's just too easy for the virus to spread even when it's warm and hot as opposed to cold and dry. And do we see, I know there's also been um, questions about how much it's like the flu. What are we learning? Yeah, so there are some parallels. Um, so with flu, you can shed virus before you show symptoms. That seems to be true with COVID-19. With flu, you have a wide spectrum of disease. You have mild disease, and then you've got the very severe and lethal disease that can result from that. COVID has that same spectrum. COVID se seems to be flu though on steroids because the severe cases are much higher uh, of proportion uh, of the total cases than we see with flu. And when it targets certain populations, the elderly, people with pre-existing medical conditions, it does so in a way that's much, much more stronger and more severe than influenza does. And the other interesting thing about it is flu is also a very significant pathogen in children, but COVID-19 seems to be sparing children, for the most part, from severe disease. So there are some parallels, but very clear and distinct differences as well. And again, it, this, is, this is, you know, I, I work on flu. I think flu is a very severe public health threat. Uh, COVID-19 is an even greater public health threat right now than flu is. Have you been surprised, as someone who studies the flu and as someone who's also studied other pathogens, do you, are you surprised at sort of how virulent this COVID-19 has become? Yeah, I'm surprised at how, how the severe disease that it can cause and how easily it's spread in the population. Those are two things that rarely appear together in a new pathogen. And it's been able to do both things. It's been able to spread without being detected because of the mild disease, but yet in certain populations, it's been able to cause incredibly severe disease. So being able to do all that right from the beginning is really striking and um, very much unexpected. So I understand you are studying COVID in your lab, this COVID, COVID-19. Please tell me what you're learning. 
Yeah, so we've, we've really tried to um, establish some systems in the lab to study how the virus replicates in the upper respiratory tract. And we think, and other groups have had data showing this, that how much virus you have in your upper respiratory tract, in your nose, in, in the back of your throat, may be important for um, how efficiently a virus is spread from person to person. So we have some model systems in our lab that are allowing us to look at how the virus is replicating under those conditions and trying to tease out how the cells are responding to the infection. But also if we can pinpoint a particular protein in the virus that is responsible for that. And if we do that, then we can open up the whole sort of um, a barrage of things that we can do to try to come up with better interventions that might help reduce the spread of this virus. So if you could figure out what it is that makes COVID so special and unique, <laughs> um, you can perhaps find uh, that as a target for medication. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we think that it probably has something to do with the virus, but it probably also has to do with how you're responding to the virus. So it represents a really interesting area where you can come up with therapies that target the virus, but maybe also target your response to the virus. And that opens up the, cat, the um, potential for uh, finding drugs and other interventions that could work there. Does there seem to be um, any correlation with uh, how much virus you have in your body? Yeah, so I think there's some really interesting studies that uh, do point to the fact that um, you can vary tremendously from person to person in terms of how much virus is there. Some people are testing with very high amounts of virus in, in their upper respiratory tract. A few days later, that seems to be going away. So we think that in your upper respiratory tract, in your nose, for instance, that there's um, going to be a better correlation there between transmission than with disease severity. With disease severity, it's going to depend on how much virus is in your lungs and deeper in your respiratory tract than in your upper respiratory tract. So I'm not a doctor or not a scientist. Um, so does that mean that if I were somehow to get the droplets in my nose before my throat, that that would be different in how sick I got? I think it depends on how well the virus initially starts to get in and replicate in your upper respiratory tract. That's really probably going to be a fulcrum there. If it replicates well, then it has the potential to not only be spread well, but also to penetrate deeper into your lungs. If it gets in your upper respiratory tract and just does a little bit of work there, then you might have this mild disease. You can maybe spread it, but you really won't suffer too much from the severe disease symptoms. This is all very interesting. So you're, uh, we talked about antibody tests before, and I know you are working on some of your own. Yeah. So, you know, we um, here at the School of Public Health, and particularly in the micro molecular microbiology department, are trying to support the convalescent plasma therapy trial, where people are being identified who have recovered from an infection, and we're going to use their plasma to treat people who are in early stages of COVID-19 disease. And so, a couple of laboratories here are trying to come up with all of the assays to figure out who is the best donor that has the best plasma, that has the best antibodies to be used in these trials. Is that the stage you're at, collecting the uh, plasma? We've been optimizing our tests, as mm -hmm. I said before, when, when it comes to the tests that people are using for blood tests. What we really want to make sure is that we have good assays that tell us a lot about the antibody responses. It looks like the study is starting to enroll donors this week, so we expect in the next couple of weeks to really start gearing up in terms of screening potential donors and, and pushing that plasma through the pipeline. Well, then we will have to check back in with you later, Andy. Thank you so much for being a guest today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks very much. Thank you for listening to Public Health on Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Please send questions to be covered in future podcasts to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. This podcast is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Lamare Morales. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker and Spencer Greer, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.